This week's podcast is sponsored by the Bowers & Wilkins 800 Series Diamond Range. This is not just another speaker range. Each new generation of 800 Series Diamond is a landmark event for Bowers & Wilkins. This is the brand's benchmark, its icon, the most advanced range of loudspeakers its engineering team knows how to make. Experience the sound for yourself at authorised dealers or learn more at BowersWilkins.com. Hello and welcome to David Forum's podcast, streaming live on Wednesday, the 27th of October. And joining me tonight, Ed Selly. Your leg, I'd like to break it. And Steve Withers. I'm your boyfriend now. Right, so uh, welcome along. We're back again for the Hardware Podcast. We're going to be talking about lots of equipment tonight. So uh, once we find out what everybody's been up to in, uh, since we were last year, uh, we're going to cover some competitions. We're also going to talk about an OLED shootout that's happening very soon. Uh, that you can come along to if you want. Uh, we're also going to talk about an Anthem AV receiver, EQing your home cinema, uh, as well as software-wise. We've got uh, Ed's album of the week. I've got to say, uh, I started listening to it on Monday. It's been on high rotation. It's very good. It's well worth uh, staying around for to find out what it is. Steve's going to be talking about 4K discs of the week. We're also going to talk about Halloween discs, um, recommendations if you want to scare yourself in 4K and Dolby Atmos, then Steve will probably tell you what the best discs are for for that uh, we're going to do that later on so that's all coming up tonight also the live chat is live as we are uh, tonight on youtube so if you want to ask a question then uh, enter it into the chat window i can see there's quite a few of you watching at the moment uh, as we start so welcome along good evening to you if you're listening uh, a little bit later in the week or to the recorded version uh, then, of course, you can still give us your feedback. You can still ask questions. You can send an email to podcast at avforums.com and we will ask it the next week that the hardware podcast, if it's a hardware question, uh, is on. So uh, what have been up to this week, Ed? Um, it's been uh, a mixed week. Uh, I actually messaged you uh, shortly after the movies podcast because... Um, I woke up feeling absolutely dreadful. I thought, oh, no, I might have COVID. So I did a COVID test, didn't have COVID. And um, I had to confront the sort of possibility of being ill in a way that wasn't actually COVID. Um, and, yeah, I've just been a bit under the weather, a bit burned out. So I actually took the unusual step of having three days where, aside from answering emails, which is a, you know, it's an undertaking in itself, but it's not work work, I didn't do anything. Um, I... I actually had to take some time out to to sort of put myself. Is this back your together. way of saying that the copy is going to be late again this month? Of course, it's going to be late. He's already told me it's going I've to be late. Already told him it's going to be late. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, such is life. Maybe you're uh, not ill. Maybe you're just getting old like the rest of us. But this is also indisputable. <laughs> I, mean, I feel shit every morning, but that's just because, you know, I'm old. Yeah. You know, Bone yeah. ache, and you know, you can't get out of bed. Now that yeah. winter, now now that mornings are dark and it's cold. I just, I get you don't want to get out from Monday. It's a real duvet. struggle. It's a real oh, no. struggle. Uh, yeah. Well, no, I, but I have. I'm pleased to say that actually taking a few days out has improved matters. Uh, I have been back in harness doing work for you guys and some other people. Um, I, I also, and you'll have to steady yourselves at this point. I went to the cinema last night. Um, Ooh. I know. First time in about two years, understand? It is. It is without exaggeration about the first time in yeah. two years. Because uh, I thought, do you know what? I, I feel that doing warrant, I warrant's a big screen experience. Um, and I found that the view in Bedford is both convenient for my girlfriend and I to reach from two different start locations. Uh, and it was a fiver. Um, it's very reasonable. Which I feel yeah, is, a, it is, a, is a solid price to go and see. 15 quid at the IMAX in Cardiff. Now, it wasn't IMAX. It was a large-ish screen. I would, I would describe the hardware as usefully up to date. It did serious base. Um, so, yeah, I, thought, I felt that I felt better going to see something for a fiver than I did, as you say, Steve, paying anything up to three times that. Um uh, and I like to feel that me buying a ticket, actually two tickets, is what swung them, that what tipped it over the edge for mm, them to yeah. uh, agree to make the second one. Um, so that was good news as well. Uh, so I did that. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's 
sort of the summation of my existence up until this point. So it's it as I say, I'm now feeling quite a bit better. Uh, I don't. I'm assuming I had a cold or some other, or as Steve says, I might just be getting old, and this is the bleak future that I have to look forward to. But the long and the short of it is, I am now back in harness, back at work, um, and who knows? I might actually see one or two more films in the knowledge that I can do so for a fiver plus a pound to park. So this could be the start of something that, truly quite, radical. And that is quite reasonable. I mean, well, the that, other thing that is, price point, it makes it affordable. You know, when you're talking about 15 quid or no, two absolutely. people going 30 quid, you must buy the disc. <laughs> Or, or, you know, down in Red No, Street. I completely agree. And uh, and the view in Bedford, I've never been before. It's smack bang in the middle of Bedford. So you get a parking agreement with the multi-storey car park over the way. There were plenty of restaurants and stuff. It was, uh, it, you know what? It was a, a, a good uh, experience. So Definitely um, adequate. Yes. Do you know what? I mean, I, I, I'm i sure that there are better cinemas. Uh, well, there is. I mean, the Odeon in Bletchley is is brand spanking you. It's got IMAX and it will push your eardrums into the centre of your brain if you want it to. But it's more expensive and you're sort of limited to the chain restaurants that are directly around it. This, I felt, was a, a good balance. And on the way back, because it finished at 1130 uh, I was able to beat my uh, projected arrival time at my house on a journey of 15.3 miles by five minutes, uh, which I was quite impressed by. So, yeah, but but how many litres of fuel did you burn doing that? Uh, about 400. How many speeding yeah. tickets did you get? <laughs> <laughs> it's deserted so, country uh, Had you buried the lead here? So what did you think of the film? I did enjoy it. Um, it it's a standard Villeneuve thing, isn't it? It moves at a sedate Glacially pace. Glacially slow. Um, but I don't know. It does seem to be a... Uh, um, you know, it's not a Villeneuve thing in itself because it's got to be other people doing it. But there is... Uh, a, a tangibility to the effects work in the Villeneuve films, which just really helps make sort of anchor what is a very fantastic universe. I thought it was reasonably well cast. And yes, uh, I had read, um, I'd had both your feedback and I'd read Tom's review and I'd read some other reviews. I wasn't going in expecting it to move at the speed of a Bourne film. So um, <laughs> I wasn't too disappointed to by ending. that. <laughs> Uh, and yes, I will also, I, I, you had forewarned me that it basically just peters out. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. okay. um, he's, he's, a, he's a very visual director, so I, I, I am going to try and see this on the big screen because I think that's where you need to see it, really. Um, I mean, I wouldn't even, even though we have cinemas at home, Steve, I think you still need to see it on the, on the big um, screen. I, pref- when looking forward to watching it at home, if only because I would rather see it in 2.35 to 1 than the whatever the hell aspect ratio that is in IMAX cinemas, depending on which IMAX cinema you go to. But mm. uh, the one in Cardiff, the screen is, I think I thought Limaxes were supposed to be 1.9 to 1, but the screen ratio definitely isn't 1.9 to 1. It's more, it's closer to 1.3 to 1. And I think it might be a repurposed cinema from something else. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's slightly less a box, sometimes it isn't. It's, it's dog's dinner, if you want my opinion. I mean, I wish they would just, use a normal aspect ratio <laughs> uh, i mean i would say i mean it's been it has been 20 years since i read the book uh, i might be tempted to read it again i have to be honest um but something that i think goes underappreciated is you read i i do remember reading the the herbert description of things like ornithopters and and you know the big space line and stuff and for the most part they just sounded bollocks i just remember li- li- reading the description of ornithopter and thought well you were probably on the benelin when you came up with that and somebody somehow managed to turn that into a compelling sort of yeah, no, object on screen and that's just one of a, a hundred you know tiny examples of of you know the fil- that first film is quite slow paced world building but my word they put a lot of effort into it so yeah i I, as i say at a fiver uh i'm having a nice chicken burger beforehand i enjoyed it yep good stuff steve what you been up to nothing really (laughs) all right we'll move on then just hiding Uh, under honestly i I was sitting here thinking as ed was talking i was thinking what have i done over last week and uh, the honest answer is not much (laughs) i watched specter with my dad um which on repeat viewing was a lot better than I remember it. Um, my memory of Spectre was it was a bit shit, <laughs> and um, and you know uh, that Craig was phoning it in, and and uh, well, some of my complaints are still valid, which is I don't like the fact that he's in some way related to Blofeld. That's just ridiculous, and um, and I didn't find 
uh, much to my surprise, given that he's been quite on, ominous in other roles. But I thought that um, also Chops, he's a who plays Spectre. I've forgotten his name. Um, I know the bloke, and I can't remember his name either. The Austrian chap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from uh, Inglorious Bastards film. Yeah, I know. I know it is. I just can't remember his name. Well, no, you can't remember. I'm hoping Phil could pitch in here quick. Christoph Fools. That's it. Yeah. Um, Christoph Fools. Said that without yeah, even yeah. moving my lips. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Oh, Daniel, projections. Just, Daniel just stuck it up on the uh, thing. Thank you very much, mate. Uh, yeah, Christoph Fools. Is, I didn't find him particularly threatening. The scene where he's torturing Bond. I'm totally distracted by the fact he's not wearing any socks, which is just really <laughs> off-footing. And um, that bit I didn't like still, but the rest of it was pretty good. The opening one take scene I thought was really well done. Um, some good action in it. Uh, so it was better than I remember, uh, and I did quite enjoy it. So uh, okay. I did that. To, otherwise, no, I haven't done a lot. It's been a it's been a quite week, really. All right, okay, good stuff. Uh, Mustang's gone away for the winter. Hibernating now, is it? So you put it in a big a big shoe box in some straw. Uh, no, it's sitting on it's sitting on it's still sitting out in the open, but it's now somewhere out of the way and it's not gonna get salt on it and that kind of thing. So it's uh uh so yeah, it's away for the winter. So I can't say I'm missing it at the minute because the weather's been rubbish. So um and I've got my little Kia seed, which gets me around quite nicely actually. So it doesn't burn one pound fifty something a litre. No, Ed, Ed, I I fill it up at the start of the month and I've still got stuff in the tank at the end of the month it's fantastic and it costs 50 quid to fill up and you it's doing about it six before you store it don't you drain the no 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 it's sitting on a drive so it'll still get started up and it'll oh. still get moved around and that kind of thing it's at a friend's house it's just out of the way it's not sitting on the street like it normally does um ready for for um for next year will i buy a marquee uh no because it's not a mustang it's an suv um Got nothing against it. Nice, nice SUV. It's not a Mustang. It's a marketing exercise. Uh, sorry about that, Paul Munger. And um, somebody else, Huggy, asked when we were reviewing the JZ1500. Uh, review's already up. It's on the website. Go find it. Uh, click on the menu at the top and can. drop down. Uh, so I've actually got the JZ2000 behind me at the moment, and uh, I'm not running a subwoofer with it. I'm actually running a real woofer with it at the minute. I'm dog sitting this evening, so Aww. that's that star there. She's sound. She's had her tea and a walk, so she's sound. Uh, so, yeah, I've got the JZ2000 in at the minute, so that review will be up a um, uh, couple of weeks. Hopefully. Uh, right. So that's what I've been doing. Not a lot. There's a lot of things coming up. Uh, one thing that we're going to talk about uh, when we get to hardware, but before that, we need to look at competition. So, Ed, what can we win? Hold on a moment. Let me get my jobby out. I knew you'd be ready. Well, ish. So I was momentarily distracted. Right. You can win. And this is a hell of a prize. If you haven't already entered this, you, you are mental. It's a KEF LS50 Wireless 2 all in one speaker system worth two and a half grand. Uh, one of three Violet Smart Switch Light Home Control Panels worth £169. I'm sure that that could be modified to also include a self-destruct sequence if you wanted. Uh, win copies of Criterion's October titles on Blu-ray, The Courier, Escape Room 2, Demonic Spirit Untamed and Injustice on Blu-ray, The Guest Limited Edition 4K UHD set and a Resident Evil 4K double bill for patrons only. So head over to avforums.com forward slash competitions to enter. All competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. Basically everyone except Phil. We have some previous winners. Frog Lady won Peter Rabbit on 4K. Um, Ace of Wands uh, won Mortal Kombat Battle of the Realms on Blu ray. Bradley 72 uh, won the patron exclusive Mayor of East Town on Blu ray. Good prize. Alabama 99 won Criterion September titles on Blu ray. Matt's on the Beach won the podcast exclusive Lost Boys on Blu ray. And Gunsturm won a copy of Occupation Rainfall on Blu-ray. So well done, all of you. Stay tuned for a chance to win a podcast-exclusive copy of The Descent and The Descent Part 2 on Blu-ray. All right, good stuff. That, that Kef prize, Can you, is there an HDMI uh, ARC connector? On? Uh, yes, there is. It's a seriously capable piece of kit. I mean, the review's up on the site. It's, um, it's, a, diff later. it's a different construct to, if you like, a conventional all-in-one speaker system. But And it needs two main plugs instead of one. But it, it just as a, in terms of its performance across the board for music and, and film and TV work, I was 
extraordinarily impressed by it. I think it's a genuinely excellent product. Okay. Right. Uh, that's competitions. Get yourself entered in there. Uh, if you're a patron as well, you've got good odds when it comes to winning stuff on the patron side of things as well. And uh, like Ed says, a podcast exclusive competition. You need the question before you'll get the answer right. Uh, that's coming up as well. Uh, apologies as well for my camera. It wasn't working until about three minutes before we went on tonight. And uh, it's now decided that the uh, it doesn't like the settings and it's uh, raising everything. So apologies for that. We'll be back in a sec, hopefully with everything fixed, uh, to discuss hardware. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can also make a one-off donation through the Super Chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. Hello? Bill, you, you need to draw, yeah. It's all going to... Oh, pop. slick and professional as ever. Slick as... Right. Um, 2011, Nigel H. Uh, donated five pounds. Thank you very much. He says, pleasure to support. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Nigel, that is appreciated. Um, right, so let's move on. We've got some bits and pieces to get through uh, tonight. The first one is a bit of news uh, for an event that is happening. Uh, Abbey Road Studios. Have you ever fancied going to Abbey Road Studios? Now's your chance. Uh, limited places. I think we're limited to 25 to 30 uh, AV Forums members. It might actually be less than that. Um, depends on whether you ask, answer the question correct, because there is a question to ask answer but you could join us uh along there myself and steve are going to be there on the evening um it's an oled shooter it's phillips that are running it so it's not an ev forums event it's a phillips event however to be fair to phillips because people uh, i've noticed on the thread jump at the conclusions and all oh, well the phillips is going to obviously going to win and all the rest of it um if you just the phillips they actually put their money where their mouth is and uh, this is done quite well for a shootout that's run by a manufacturer. Uh, they cover all the TVs up, so you don't know which TV is which. So there's no brand bias going in. Um, there is a, a, a screen that goes up between clips, so you can't see the menus or other graphics popping up on the screen, so you can't guess which screen is which. Um, all the screens are calibrated for the first section anyway. So there's two sections on the evening. The first one is calibrated SDR and uh, out of the box HDR in filmmaker mode. And then the second part of the evening is Danny Tark, who is Philip's uh, picture guru, going through why the Philips TV looks best in vivid mode, and that might sound a little bit silly, but people who have been along to these events in the past uh, will vouch to the fact that it is a very, very interesting evening, and it's uh, it's good to hear uh, from a manufacturer and also have a manufacturer there and listening to you and your feedback and what you want from a screen. So, yes, it is run by a manufacturer, but, hey, they're putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, these sets are calibrated. They are disguised. It is a blind shootout. Um, it's not double blind, but it is a blind shootout. Um, it's very, very difficult to pick which is which. Um, so it's not a guarantee that Phillips is going to win, Steve. No, it's not. It's, I mean, I was there for the very first one of these that they did. And I remember thinking, like, well, taking a bit of a risk here, particularly the first section where it's just the four TVs, all of them calibrated to the same standards. So therefore, they essentially look pretty much the same, um, which you know, is the idea behind calibration. And um, you know, you think, I don't, I mean, I'm, I, you know, they're probably not going to win that because, you know, it's just going to go 25% to each TV. So I was quite surprised when they did win it. Um, but yeah, I've, having been there and I'll be there again this time, you know, to make sure it's above board. Um, they, they do take it seriously. It's done in a professional and fair and unbiased manner. And um, obviously they're, they're dealing with an audience of people who know what they're talking about, people that are enthusiastic, yeah. people that, you know, are not mugs. They're not going to be, you know, you, you can take your average punter and then you can probably give them some old spiel and they fall for it, but not the AV Forums crowd. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of courage to put your TV in front of 25 yeah, AV Forums members. <laughs> so yeah. I've got to respect them for that. <laughs> absolutely. So uh, if you fancy joining us at Abbey Road Studios, uh, you are the judge on the evening. Me and Steve have nothing to do with it other than making sure that it is done fairly um, and that the sets are calibrated correctly. Do you wear and... black and white stripy tops, gladiators referee style? Not quite. 
Oh, we can't, no, we, we, wear, can't... we wear all black because A, it's slimming, and B, you know, we don't want to reflect any light onto the TV screens. That's no, it. Fair, yeah, fair point. Black. That's it. So uh, if you want to join us, then there is a thread in the OLED forum. Uh, go and uh, get the email address there. Um, only uh, apply if you can make it. Yes, it is London again. I noticed somebody did say shame it's London again, but hey, it's Abbey Road Studios. Yeah. It's Come not, on, it's not, it's if, not any, if anything, you know, the, the general public don't normally get access to Abbey Road Studios. It is a world-famous studio. Lots of film scores have been recorded there, lots of pop albums, well, lots Beatles of album. classics. Most of the Beatles catalogue was recorded at Abbey Road. So, yeah, it's got a bit of history. Um, it is quite a venue if you want to come along. Um, and while attending Abbey Road, I actually judge in a shootout for OLED TVs. And again, it's an opportunity to see these four TVs together. Um, and they are all four top screens from top manufacturers together. It's very rare as well. And to see them calibrated, even rarer. So that's your opportunity. Um, 16th of November. It's a Tuesday night. Get yourselves along. So uh, Li- Licensed to- Taxi Man has obviously pointed out the... Uh- Zebra Crossing Immortal. Oh, yeah, well. it's an absolute. Oh. It's, well, it's a, it's a, a tourist it, trap. Yes, it is. Uh, he was saying, I think the Zebra Crossing actually uses further down. It's not, it's the same Zebra Crossing. It had to be moved. I can't remember whether it's because of a bus lane or because of a drop curb or something similar, but it's there isn't another secret one that they did it at. They just had to move the actual physical position of the Zebra Crossing. So no matter how hard you try, you won't get the full perspective of Abbey Road and you'll just annoy everyone around you whilst you try and do it. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, check out the thread. Like I say, it's in the OLED forum. It's uh, If you're watching live on the video, uh, Stuart's got the thread up now. Go hunt it out. And if you can make it and you want to come along, uh, then apply. So, right, let's uh, move on to some hardware that we're going to talk about. Let's move on to uh, an AV processor, which are becoming rare, Steve, AV processors. Um, Not a lot of them around nowadays, uh, but it's nice to see Anthem coming back, a Canadian manufacturer, coming back to the UK with some new product and an AV processor to boot. Yeah, well, they've got, they've got um, three pre- three receivers, the uh, MRX 1140, 11-channel 11 pro- um, amplifier with 15.1-channel um, processing, 15.2, actually. Uh, 740, which I've talked about before on this podcast, which uh, is seven channels um, and can do 11 point... Sorry, seven channels of amplification. It can do 11.1 channels of processing. And then there's the uh, the 540, which is uh, only five channels of built-in and 7.1 channels processing. And there are two... Well, there will be two... Uh, processor. So there's currently the one I'm going to talk about now, which is the AVM70, which is a 15.2 channel processor. And there is an upcoming AVM90, which is a 15.4 channel processor. Now, as far as I can tell, the two are identical, apart from the fact that the 70 um, calibrates for two subs, independent subs, and the AVM90 calibrates for four independent subs. But the AVM90 is about double the price. So, I mean, bang for your buck, I'd definitely be looking at the AVM70 unless you really, really, really have to f- have four independent subs. Because um, uh, as far as I can tell, other than that, they, they appear to be identical. Um, you know, maybe they're going to include, I don't think, well, based upon the website and the specs I've read, that's the only difference. So, you know, if you're asking me which one should I get, um, get the get the AVM seventy because it's half the price. Uh, in fact, the price is just in case you're wondering seven three thousand five hundred and ninety nine quid. So that puts it in the same bracket as uh, what we've we got the Arcam AV forty and the yeah. uh, JBL Synthesis uh, SD SDP fifty five. Yeah, which is essentially the same thing but with yeah. a few tweaks. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the only other thing I can think of in that price bracket would be the Marantz, the 8802, is it these days, I think? Uh, um, yeah, and there's a Yamaha as well. Um, oh, yeah. And there's that's a quite an old too. lady now, though, isn't it? But it is, yeah. It's, it's, it's getting on a little bit now. It'll be coming up to about two and a half, three year old. Yeah, now, that, but... didn't get an up, that didn't get a, a refresh with the new Avantage lineup, did it? So it's the same one no. from two years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's not, a, as you say, Phil, there's not a lot of, I mean, there are some more high-end stuff, you know, like the Triumph and the Lindorf. But if you're looking at that sort of, sub five grand bracket um around that price point then yeah you're looking at um you're looking at um at the arcam the anthem the jbl the uh, marantz or the yamaha uh the anthem 
uh, looks identical to so all their receivers and and the processor all look exactly the same. They had a, a redesign this year. They do look a damn sight nice. better than they used they look, to. Big improvement on the old ones, yeah. They, they look um, uh, they look very linged off though. I think a lot of stuff these days. If you're saying with the JBL synthesis, they all seem to be. I don't know whether they, you know, they've all been using the same designers, but yeah, they've all got this kind of minimalist Scandinavian look about them now. Mm. Um, yeah. A lot of gloss black glass in there, matte black combos. Um, I like it. It's, it's a nice look. Um, I will say, and I said this about the 740 as well. I think a lot of the changes with this new lineup are largely cosmetic. I don't think that under the hood they are that different from the previous generation there are some differences but they, they are i mean if you look at the display for example it's definitely you know it's not the dot matrix green thing that was on the previous generation but it doesn't do anything different it's just you know very minimal in terms of the information it provides so it's not like the uh color displays on the arcam or the nad um uh, amplifier for example so you know it, it's still a very basic display but it's a nice design it looks nice it's well made it's got the same remote control uh, as previous generations, which is good because it's a well laid out design and it's it's backlit, which is always useful in a home cinema. In terms of its features, um, as I said, it's 15.2 channel processing. It can do Dolby Atmos. Uh, they claim it can do DTSX Pro. Um, that's definitely coming, but I don't think it's currently doing DTSX Pro. I think it's just limiting at the moment to DTSX 7.1.4, um, but that is in the works. Always difficult to tell sometimes because you think, oh, well, does this disk is this just going to do 7 point, uh, or 9.2.6, or is it just limited to 7.1.4? Um, but uh, Is there yeah, a master list of that anyway, Steve? So well, sort of things... I know of. And the thing is, whereas, whereas with, Dol with Dolby Atmos, I can always check because I've got a Dolby Atmos demo disc that's got 9.1.6 test signals. Um, I don't have that with my, my Dolby, my DTS, X demo disc that has 7.1.4 test signal. So I'm not entirely sure. Uh, usually though, the best way to try and find out is if, because um, the up mixing should use all the speakers. So if it is using 9.1.6 up mixing, then it will use all, my, all, all those 15.1 speakers. Um, so I got a sneaking suspicion that they haven't actually added it yet, even though they did tell me they had. Uh, it also does IMAX enhanced, um, which, uh, you know, basically beefed up the bass from what I can tell. <laughs> And um, and uh, there aren't that many discs that use it currently. I've got a few myself, but uh, it's pretty, still pretty limited. There's no Oro 3D. Some might bemoan that fact, but I think most people probably wouldn't care less. Um, you know, there are a few fans of Oro 3D, particularly when it comes to music, but I think you know, obviously from the movie side, there's literally nothing. I've, oh, not literally, because I've got three, three discs that use Oro 3D. But um, uh, if you want that, then Arkham does use it. Um, and so does... Um, uh, I think Marantz, yeah, Marantz got it. Maybe, no, no, Marantz have it as well. So it's got a pretty good sp spread of um, of uh, audio codecs. It's uh, HDMI 2.0. So um, there is an HDMI 2.1 upgrade in the works. I think you'll have to pay for it. Um, but if you need HDMI 2.1 for any reason, that is coming. Actually, you know, in my opinion, you could get around, unless you're using it with a projector, you can get around it by sending yeah. them audio into the tv and then sending it back via i would i would like, always do it that way just because yeah, they lag you don't want, you don't down. want anything in your chain that's going to cause any lag so yeah even if it's yeah. straight through it you're so still going to cause lag. don't really think not having not having hdmi 2.1 is that big a deal on a receiver i think you know there are ways around it and some in some respects like phil just said connecting your games consoles directly to your tv might be a better choice anyway the only exception to that I can think of is if you're using a games console with a projector. Um, it's uh, It doesn't have a remote app currently, but I believe one is in the works, but it has got a really groovy um, web-based user interface now that makes setup and um, setup in particular very easy. It really works well. And obviously it's, you know, it's an Anthem uh, processor, so it's got ARC Genesis, which means it not only do you have ARC uh, room correction, but it comes with a calibrated uh, UMIC one based on the UMIC one mic. Um, in the box with a mic stand as well. So um, it's very easy to set up. I think, and we'll talk about this a bit more in detail, so I won't go on about it now, but I, I think Anthem's a good system, get good results. And like I said, you can, it calibrates the two uh, subs independently, whereas um, the 740, for example, that I, I reviewed earlier, that only does a mono sub signal. And um, feature-wise, it's, uh, it's got most of the, I mean, it's got things like it's rune ready, uh, or, or rather, I think that might also be something that's in the pipeline. That is coming. 
and um, and uh, uh, Spotify Connect as well. And yeah, it's got uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly well-specified, nicely designed receiver, uh, sorry, processor. And like I said, it supports up to 5.2. Uh, I ran it as a 9.2.6 system. And I've got to say, uh, performance-wise, it was superb. Uh, really, really strong, very immersive, uh, very detailed and refined performance excellence during effects around the room. Very precise location effects as well within the hemisphere of sound. Um, I thought it was great. I thought it was a really, really good product. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've owned Anthems in the past. I do think they make good products. Um, I don't think this is a quantum leap from the previous generation, but it's it's a really, really solid but There product. wasn't it that much wrong with the previous generation. No, well, that's probably true. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the one thing they did fix was the looks, which they needed. It's interesting <laughs> what you say about the control app, though. Um, I say this from, obviously, I'm saying this from a two-channel perspective rather than a, um, a multi-channel perspective. But um, I actually, it, what you've described there, web-based setup, then with a decent IR based remote control. I think the requirements for film and TV are different to, um, to, to stereo. And the idea that you were actually going to habitually make use of an app to make a, a volume adjustment on the fly just is fiction, basically. That what Anthem have got there strikes me as a, a perfectly practical combo. You go detailed for the setup and then for the most part you are just using an ir remote and that's how it's done um i'm aware that some people might vigorously disagree with me on this one but i i can control the volume of my television by an app and i have done so once for the novelty of it but otherwise oh, I, 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 any product where you have to use an app to control it drives me nuts because i have yes. no interest in yep. getting my phone out to change the volume um, that was one of my big, you know, it's a big black mark for me. If you get a product like a soundbar and it's only app control, it's like stuff this. I, don't, I can't be bothered. Um, whereas, you know, yeah, you're right. If you want to just change volume, you just want to grab the remote up, down, or whatever, and done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the web based interface is really not so much you can control it for using that, but that's not really, I mean, it's, no, it's, it's not the purpose of it. Um, there is, as I said, there will be a remote app coming. If you're the kind of person that is, you know, has your phone surgically attached to your hand and wants to use it, but, uh, well, um, don't lie, Steve. You do too. It just has pornography on it. <laughs> but uh, the controller's good. I mean, it's a nice controller and it works really well. And like I said, it's got a backlight, so it's ideal for using in a home yeah. cinema. Um, one thing I will point out is, and on the audio side of things, since Ed's brought it up, is that the, where is it? I can't find the, the um, here we go. Uh, the, it uses the AKM 32-bit 768 kilohertz DAC, mm. uh, or it's supposed to. But I believe there's been a big fire at the factory. There was a big fire. Yes. And there aren't many of them around. <laughs> so it's possible. Certainly the one the, the processor that I was reviewing has been sitting in the PR guy down the road from me's house or, or office for since about spring. So I know it's an early unit. <laughs> um, but it's possible that later units that you buy now might not be using that uh, DAC because they can't get them. Um, no. But I would know. I would have no idea how you would tell the difference. Or you no, would or have to, find to be, open it up, presumably. <laughs> you'd have to take it apart, have a look at the board. Well, if you can see, you can see that if you can see the chip, it's pretty obvious because actually AKMs don't have much written on them. But the only thing that fits into the same slot and does the same stuff is an ESS, and they always have ESS written on top of the chip. Um, I would make the possibly bold assertion that in an environment such as this. I think you'd be very pressed to tell the difference, <laughs> but but yeah, it's it's a bit of a shame. And if you are a fanatical DSD user or things like that, AKM is possibly the better choice. But I would argue for the the way that film soundtracks work and for the way that most people use audio, there's there's nothing in it really. I, I do I do think that um, you know obviously this is an AV processor and it's aimed primarily at using it for um, for movies, but. Uh... It's not wrong with it if you want to use it with music too. I mean, a purist I mean, like yourself, Ed, may, may want to go a different route. But uh, if you're looking for something that can double, uh, you know, as a stereo unit for um, listening to music, it's very, very good. I have to be uh, honest, like, all uh, of these relatively recent AV processors I've heard in stereo have been nothing but entirely respectable. And, so, and you can use ARC to create two different profiles, yeah. one for, um, yeah. one for yeah. music, one for multi-channel. Nice. Uh, just one last thing, which is on the HDMIs. They do pass, uh, obviously, 4K60, uh, 3D, uh, HDR10, HLG, and Dolby Vision do not pass HDR10+. That will be something that's added with the HDMI 2.1 upgrade 
Um, I don't think it's a major issue for most people, but I uh, just want to mention it. <laughs> yeah, okay. And uh, as you can see, if you're watching live, the review is live. So if you want to go and yeah, find out yeah. a bit more and uh, and so on, then uh, the review is up there. It's on the homepage. Go and uh, have a read and see what Steve thought in detail. Right, so we need to move on because uh, time is ticking away. Uh, so we need to uh, cover our subject, which is building a dedicated home cinema. We've gone through most of yeah, this setup at this so point far. you built it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you haven't, then come on. What's going on? We're, we're giving you, <laughs> yeah, we're giving you plenty of time. Um, so anyway, uh, you've got everything set up. You've got your speakers in the best position in the room. You have a fair idea of where your room nodes and so on are going to be. Um, and you've done it to the best of your capabilities at this point. But you might want to add just a little touch of EQ to the system just to tie everything together. Uh, if you have done everything to plan and measured out properly and all the rest of it, you probably need absolute minimal. Um, even if you're in the ballpark, you'll need minimal. The one thing that EQ can't do, and we've, we've touched on this a, a number of times on the podcast, it can't fix a dog's dinner of a mess of a room. It's it's not a miracle yeah, worker. It's not magic. <laughs> um, it's not magic. And I think some people do think that and uh, they get annoyed when, uh, you know, their, their Odyssey system or Derek or whatever just won't do what they want it to do, which is impossible to start with. Uh, you need a good base to start from um, with every EQ That's system. B-A-S-E, not B-A-S-S. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, thanks for that, Steve. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, you need that. You need a good starting point, and if you get most of the things right to start with, the less EQ you can add, the less processing power you need, the better, and the better yeah. the results you're going to get from the system. I mean, if you were building a room from scratch, and by that I mean you were building a house around a room you were going to use for a home cinema, so you had the perfect dimensions, perfect location for the speakers. You treated the room perfectly, everything. You did all that from the beginning. You wouldn't essentially need to do any room EQ because you would have addressed the room issues yes, from yes. the very start. However, that's very unlikely. <laughs> Almost yeah. every home cinema of any type, uh, it, there is going to be a degree of compromise when you're creating, when you're building the room, but where you can place speakers, where you can put the subs, uh, the shape of the room, um, you know, the, the materials that the walls are made of, all these things are factors that will affect the, the, the acoustics of the room and therefore the sound of the system. Yeah. And so you try and mitigate as much of this as you can, as we've been discussing over the last few weeks in terms of where you put your speakers. Maybe, I mean, we'll be, we haven't really talked about it yet, but we can also talk about maybe it after this next week, or sorry, the week after next, um, a little bit about little tricks and tips for how to treat the room without you know spending a lot of money but things you can do to make um make the room uh, better but assuming you've done all of this then the last thing and assuming of course the processor or equipment you're using has some kind of room eq uh, or you could buy a third party option i suppose um you need to just fine tune what you're looking to hopefully we do at this point is just fine tune the performance generally in terms of tonal balance and specifically in terms of the, the bass and sub integration because it's at the lower frequencies, um, below 500 hertz, really, where the room has the most impact. So that's where you want to, um, that's probably going to yeah. really be doing the most of the work. Yeah. Uh, and like Steve says, most of the modern stuff has uh, an EQ system of some kind, whether it's a proprietary like ARC Genesis uh, to one manufacturer, or it's used over numerous manufacturers like Dirac is. And Odyssey as well was used over uh, a number. Of Odyssey were the first on the market to really sort of push this. And I remember interviewing Tom, Tom Holman, um, who is the guy behind THX. Um, he did all that for George Lucas and for Return of the Jedi when it was going to be shown in cinemas and so on. Um, this was one of his what, projects. We interviewed him, I think it was about 2007, maybe 2008 on the podcast. Uh, you'd have to go through the archives to find that one, but <laughs> we did. Um, and it was one of the first systems on the market. And I remember uh, being sent a, a unit, a standalone Odyssey unit all those years ago. And at the time it was like black magic. It was like, wow, what is this? And nowadays we kind of, you know, Odyssey's a bit old hat and uh, it has been updated and it, and it is a, a decent system. It's they not were, a bad system. They were system. cutting edge at the time, weren't they? They were really pushing, they were really the, the pioneers, like you said, yeah, for, yeah, of, yeah. of this idea. Yeah. But things have moved on. EQ. Yeah, I mean, they're still used by uh, Denon and Ranks, who I th yep. think off the top of my head are the only ones still using them. And it, it works very well. It's, it's a perfectly mm -hmm. good, you know, the, the, they'll come with a little microphone. They come with a cardboard stand you can use, although I'd recommend just using a, a you know, a, a camera tripod. Um, and, and they work really well. They're easy to run. They'll do a pretty good job. 
And, you know, if you just afterwards go back in, the trick is not to, to go back in afterwards and double check some things, like, for example, distance of the speakers. Usually I've got to say, all oh, this gets it pretty close. Um, yeah. I'm always amazed at how accurate they are in terms of the measurements of the speakers. Yeah. But the one uh, thing I almost always get wrong is setting the front left and right to small. Yeah. So unless you're using massive full range floor standards, you should be setting those to small, regardless of what you've got, because, um, you know, basically your, 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 your idea of setting them small is you can then set the crossover where you want it set. Because exactly. once you set everything to small in order see, you can then go in and you basically go, go and look at the uh, specs for your speakers, find out what their frequency response is, and then set the crossover to just slightly above where the bottom end of that speaker is. And then you should, you should have a nice smooth crossover. Um, but I always find that uh, after I've run Odyssey, they usually A, set the front left and right to large, which is wrong, and B, they almost always get the crossovers wrong as well. So yeah, crossovers are always wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Double check that bit. But otherwise, yeah. it's pretty good. Yeah, and one thing that if you're coming from a home cinema system that you set up a number of years ago and uh, you like the sound of and you suddenly EQ the system and have it all balanced properly the one thing uh the the one bit of feedback i always see on the forums is that suddenly the subwoofers seem to be less dominant and that's because people have a tendency to set their subwoofers pretty hot if in you their bought yourself a gigantic you want to do it don't you yeah, <laughs> thund- yeah. thunder bastard you are let's yeah. face it going to run it yeah. a little on the and, and it's <laughs> it's the one bit of feedback that always comes oh the subs are now too low and so on it's like well Yes, but they're also now balanced and, and interacting yeah. with the room the way they should be. You're not getting a resonant frequency where you're suddenly you know getting a, a gain um, in volume and so on that's overpowering, um, which a lot of if people do. Like. Dominating a soundstage, you've yeah. probably got it set up wrong because it yeah. shouldn't be dominating. It should be under. It should be laying a foundation. It should be. It should supporting be. everything else. You should. It you should, should be. One speaker is the way I always explain it. You know, if you're using subsats with it or even floor standards with it, it should sound like one full range speaker. There shouldn't be any dips or troughs or or where it gets quiet or louder in the frequency response. It should be as balanced as possible. But a lot of people don't like that sound. It's like a calibrated TV. You know, that is the Mm. correct way to see it. That's the way it's intended to be seen. That's the way the content was mastered. You will always get people who say that that is wrong and that they are right and they're going to set it to dynamic and standard. And to be fair, that's not limited to film, is it? It's not. It's not. But it's it's like that. It's uh, Find yourself into any pastime, hobby or way of life, and there's always someone doing it harder, better, and more fanatically (laughs) than you are. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> um, but if if you are going to the trouble of designing the room and you want it sounding its best with a nice balanced sound and you're coming from an old system where you have been running your subs hot, then expect to be um, perhaps initially a little bit disappointed with, with the sound. But actually, like a calibrated TV, if you spend some time with it, you suddenly realise what you've been missing. To be honest, um, it's, it's like some... I mean, uh, when you move to... Um... I mean, on a completely different sort of audio tangent, when you move to high-end uh, analog replay, people go, "Oh, where's the warmth gone?" It's like, well, no, it's it's it, you know that that sort of bloominess is what you're trying to sort of get shot of. And again, people people can find that very dis- distressing when you actually are simply broadcasting the signal and no or as little embellishment to that signal as possible. You can in the initial experience find the whole thing a little underwhelming yeah. but yeah. that's what you're yeah. shooting for I, yeah. I will also say that if you have got some you know thunder bastard subs some really good subs don't be afraid of um setting the crossovers higher because you know a subwoofer is designed to deliver low frequencies it's got to you know I'll have a big say it's a 12 inch driver you know compared to your speakers you know why let why push them why make why force them to do too much work at the low end when that's what the sub's for so um, even if your speaker looks quite big, yeah. you know, you can still cross over at a higher, you know, frequency. So, I mean, obviously 80 hertz tends to be a little rule of thumb that works quite well for just about anything. But, you know, you could go to 100. I mean, LFE is anything below 120, so you could even use 120 to cross over. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got a really capable subwoofer, make the most of it. <laughs> yeah. So getting back to EQ, and that is one of the, the bits of feedback we always get. And sometimes the EQ systems, like I say, they're not, they're not miracle workers. They will not... Uh, fix things that can't be fixed. So phase is sometimes an issue. If you've uh, wired a speaker wrong or whatever, some of these systems will pick it up. But then again, you could get a, a speaker that's bouncing off a wall in a certain way and it, it uh, assesses that as being out of phase and it's not out of phase. Um, so knowing your system as well and double checking everything. I would say Yamaha 
Yamaha YPAO system is the worst yeah. offender I've ever found for saying something's yeah. out of phase. And you go and change the input, and then you realize that it wasn't out of phase to start with. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so, so there are little things like that. Sub uh, crossovers and so on. Again, like Steve says, double check those um, with the lower end systems or, or the more common systems. When you start getting into Dirac and ARC and Room Perfect and Optimizer on the trend of, um, these systems are far more advanced. Uh, they're a lot more tweakable. Certainly, uh, Derak is is infinitely tweakable. I've never played with Trinoff Optimizer, uh, Steve, but I, I assume on a whole other on a whole other level. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. want to go down a rabbit hole uh, of audio tweaking, then you really need yourself a Trinoff because you you could. Um, I mean, it's I mean, prof- it's essentially professional kit, so uh, you, you can do just about anything you want to that system. Um, I, I, I will say, so Odyssey, as we've just discussed, is, is I guess, the entry-level area of, of, of Room EQ. There's a couple of proprietary things like the Yamaha and Pioneer, but really, at the moment, in the mid-range of stuff like the things we were talking about with the AVM70, you're really falling in. Dirac is becoming the dominant uh, Room EQ system third, you know, as a, a, that's used by multiple different manufacturers. I would say there's a good reason for that. I mean, when, um, system. <laughs> in the crossover to the two-channel items which i've tested with dirac it's just about the right balance between user friendliness and um getting deep down and nerdy if you want to yeah um uh, i mean i would say uh, i mean do the multi-channel products because obviously there's the two licenses there's you can do the whole lot or you can do 500 hertz is below i mean do the processors usually come with the whole shebang or is it uh, it depends on the manufacturer and the model uh position as well so the lower ones don't have it the higher uh more so expensive the, the so. uh cams they come with the full they full do well that stereo did as well rack. and i remember you Except saying the, NADs. the base the, the, there's also a base module um which you is it's additional you can pay for that where you can eq multiple multiple subwoofers essentially um, up yeah. to four. Um, the JBL synthesis does come with that included. So it depends. Yeah. The NAD, uh, I believe, is is but, just 500 hertz yeah. and below. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, who else uses Dirac? I, uh, I, think, that I think that's most of them, Steve, actually. I think you cover yeah, the other that, you, then, then you're on to the high end, and they're talking about Lindorf Room Perfect, which is obviously their proprietary system. Just, just about can I just off. very quickly, I, my experiences with Dirac running the full bandwidth adjustment now this is two channel uh, and we discussed that av speakers are often a little bit different to two channel speakers but nevertheless even with very accurate two channel speakers like the focal cancer which i've reviewed um i found that dirac running in the full bandwidth started to try and correct design behavior of the loudspeaker itself yeah um now you can make two arguments for this, and it's possibly a more valid argument in a multi-channel setting that you are looking for absolute EQ'd correctness. Well, we're going to come on to this because it's not necessarily true. Well, yeah. I was unhappy with one. It started to iron out the design characteristics of the loudspeakers yeah, I was it using. It will do that, yeah. yeah. So you've got to be you've got to be careful about what your target is on this and it depending i guess on this on the speakers you selected yeah. for a multi-channel my, environment my advice always with these things and, and i'm sure steve will back me up on this is like like steve said right from the beginning 500 and below that's where it'll make the biggest difference that's where it'll help you put your system together make sure that your subwoofer is correctly crossed over with whatever you're using um for front channels on a in a hi-fi system you're not going to have that issue so you know, I, anything above that, I would be very, very careful about um, applying EQ to, unless you're like in a very, very bad room that has <laughs> really yeah. bad acoustics. But at the same time, there's other ways of, of fixing that. So which we've covered, which we, we've obviously covered. So uh, I know what you're saying, Ed, but I would, I would probably in a two-channel environment not do a full sweep. I would, no, I, I, would I, I well, I mean, I've, I've reviewed products with it. Um, my findings can be read online. I, I, I was giving the benefit of the doubt for a multi-channel environment because obviously you're dealing with speakers that are generally speaking a little bit flatter anyway. Although I have to say, I imagine the differences between the folk, your the, the folk house here and your M and K's, both of them are, they have a fairly stiff pro background. So 
I still found that they were making adjustments to the focales that were fundamentally altering the behavioural characteristics mm. of the speaker, and I wasn't yeah. happy yeah. with that. That's, that's, that's one thing. Yeah, it's one thing to keep in mind. Bear in mind as well uh, if if you are going to apply uh, EQ. Right. So just to wrap up, there are the different systems there. We've used most of them. In fact, I think we've used all of them within our reviews now. Um, so if there was one that gave absolutely cracking results with the bare minimum of input. Um, I would put forward Room Perfect, which is uh, uh, the Lingdorf system. Oh, well, I was going to say that I think one of the interesting things about EQ systems over the last few years is that they, they've become incredibly sophisticated, but surprisingly easy to use. So Dirac, yeah. for example, um, you know, you don't have to be, have a degree in acoustics to use it. It's, it's a, it, it takes you through the process step by step. Same with Anthem Room Correction as well. You know, there's a graphical interface. You can see the measurements for the speakers. And at the end, you can apply a sort of, you know, a, 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 an automatic uh, they can apply a, a curve, a filter to the, to the curve automatically, or you can create your own filters, which mm. ed, means you could then maybe adjust the higher frequencies yeah. to retain the characteristic of your speaker. Um, when you move on to the higher end stuff, you've got two, uh, uh, there's two kind of versions. There's Trinov, where you can do absolutely anything <laughs> to absolutely anything uh, and to your heart's content. But you do need, I mean, there are, it is easy to use. And there is a sort of, you know, again, a more automated approach where it does it for you. Or if you know what you're doing, you can go in and you can really have a field day. Alternatively, if you just want to run something once, get a great result and that's it, forget about it, then Room Perfect is brilliant because you right, basically- Which is exactly what I said. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry. I was just trying to get, get, get there by explaining why the other- By, by, by going around the whole- Add meat to the house bones. and estate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than just going down the cul-de-sac, you went around the whole house and estate. But yeah. No, no, I don't want, um, I'm not going down a cul-de-sac. <laughs> But if it's ease of use, there are systems there, even in the high end. And, and so I what think I was the, trying to say, Phil, is that, that they are all Christ. relatively easy to use. Yeah. The point is they are all relatively easy to use, but for, for amazing results with the minimal effort, Room Perfect <laughs> comes out. Yeah, which is what I said right to start with. But never mind. We got there. Uh, yeah. So there, there are plenty of systems out there, depending on what comes with the product uh, uh, that you purchase. Well, it will obviously depend on what you use, but they're, they're all of a relative usefulness these days, and some of them are absolutely fantastic. Most of them are really easy to use if you just want to set it up once and go. If you want to deep dive in Dirac and uh, Trinov are the ones to, and ARC are the ones probably to, to keep an eye on. Um, and if you just want a really good result with the bare minimum of measurements and so on, uh, then Lingdorf's Room Perfect seemed to have that one nailed, basically. Um, so, yeah, it, and I've gone back to Odyssey, having used Room Perfect for a while, and my God, what a jump. Um, just in, <laughs> in the capabilities, because uh, I had to uh, eventually give the Lingdorf back. It, <laughs> He had to had to really sort of force me to give it back. The bailiffs round. Almost, <laughs> almost. <laughs> I did fight it, but I had to eventually give it back, unfortunately. But yes, um, Room Perfect's great. Getting back to Odyssey, you realise just how easy uh, and intuitive a system it is to use, and the results are fantastic. Whereas Odyssey needs a lot of work, a lot of uh, um, tinkering to get the same the type of results. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, right. So that covers that subject. Like Steve says, uh, when we come back uh, next month, uh, we will look at little tips and tricks in terms of improving your sound by just adding little bits of furniture, maybe some some things hanging on a wall, maybe some curtains add into the room. Yeah, or we'll do some do's and don'ts. <laughs> do's and don'ts, yeah. You know, where, where do you position your lighting and so on? Uh, we will cover that when we come back next month. And then we'll, hopefully we'll be wrapping up on this um, before Christmas, because we have some Christmas special stuff. Well, to at through. Christmas, we can also discuss improving the performance of your equipment by drinking a bottle of wine. Yes, absolutely. Tremendously effective. Cost, cost effective. So better. Cost effective, not so great for your health. But yeah, we'll, we'll come to that one. And eating lots of food as well. Yeah, looking forward to that. But anyway, uh, that wraps up this week's look at the home cinema. Um, so let's go and have a quick look and see if there's any Q&A to do. Um, I have try, been trying to keep... I haven't uh, seen any, actually. I haven't seen anything sticking out. Um, so There was one about OLED burn-in. Um, it's from someone who's asked the question in... Uh, in BFI, uh, so black frame insertion, effective rate of reduced risk. And if you set the TV up correctly, um, use filmmaker mode if you're not going to get it calibrated. Um, switch off the energy-saving stuff. You won't get any burn-in or image retention if you're using the TV in that manner and you're watching movies 
um, and normal TV. Uh, don't worry about burning or image retention. It's not going to be an issue. If you're running in brighter modes and you're leaving static images and so on on screen, that's when you'll get image retention. That's when you're going to get issues. Um, cutting the brightness in half, yes, it'll help, but also cut your brightness in half. Yeah, um, yeah, you can't so, use BFI so with, with HDR. For and yeah, exactly. No, you're going to lose at least 100, 150 nits uh, off your top end if you use it with. But so, like I say, set the TV up correctly. If it's got filmmaker mode, use filmmaker mode. And then if it has, uh, if you're using it in a bright room, you can adjust the brightness. Don't be scared to adjust the brightness. Don't listen to the internet. The internet tends to exaggerate no. the bad, bad side of things. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have to explain that, but it gets to the point where you just think, my God, yeah, people are still going on about burning their attention. It's an issue if you don't use the TV correctly. If you on have the it plus in- side, they have now given up telling people that they need to regas their televisions, and it's only taken, what, but, 50 years? And, and the fact that plasma is no plasma longer anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. details. Yeah, and people For- think if people think that's an urban legend or an urban myth. That's not. We did some secret filming many moons ago. Uh, long before Steve even joined AV Forums, yeah. we went out with a hidden camera and some microphones into some retailers and asked them questions about the TVs. And yes, on two occasions, we were told we need to regas our plasma. So, yeah. Uh, but when it comes to burning, don't worry about it, unless you are running it in dynamic mode and leaving static images like gaming HUDs and that kind of thing on screen for long periods, you will run the risk then. If it's a newer OLED TV as well, make sure you leave it in standby. You don't unplug it from the wall. Uh, but switch it off into standby because overnight it will run some cycles, duty cycles, to make sure that um, there is no retention on your screen and keep your screen healthy. It's important that you also do that. Don't unplug it from the wall um, overnight. Leave it in standby. Right. I think that answers the question. Just that we got one to last that I thought was quite interesting. Lee asks, has anyone done HDMI 2.1 properly? I feel burned with false promises on the Sony X900H, then Denon, Marantz, and Yamaha, all just a mess. I think the feedback is that fundamentally the people that have done it properly are TV manufacturers. So just use their HDMI 2.1 inputs and feedback from yeah. their using ERC, EARC. And again, don't worry about 48 gigabits per second versus 40 gigabits per second. It's a, it's a non-issue. Um, yeah. in the current yeah, climate, and it's going to be on a- non 8K devices, it's an on, yeah, issue. yeah, which is just what I was going to say. Steve, thanks for jumping in <laughs> yet again. But yes, unless you're going 8K, you don't need 48 gigabits per second, 40 is more than enough, right? I think that answers all our questions this mm-hmm. evening. Um, if you do have any more, you listen to the podcast a little bit later in the week or the uh, recorded version, um then send us an email, podcast.avforums.com, and send us your question, and we will get around to answering that. So coming next, and very brief, is software. If you enjoy the podcast on YouTube, then please like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, then please leave us a rating on your podcast app. We invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast.avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at AV Forums. Of course, when I say don't listen to the internet, listen to AV Forums. <laughs> We're the good internet. It's, it's the We're bad internet asked. you want to worry about. Yeah, bad internet you worry about. <laughs> don't worry about us. Uh, right, okay. Uh, very, very quickly, get through software um, because we are running a little bit over time. Uh, so Ed's album of the week, like I say, I've had this on high rotation. It's, uh, it's a very, very good album. What is it, Ed? It's a grower, isn't it? Um, this is a chap called Hayden Thorpe. Um, the album has the slightly odd name of Moon Dust for My Diamond. Now, Hayden Thorpe used to be in a band called Wild Beasts. And if you haven't heard anything of Wild Beasts, my word, what a treat is in store for you there. They were magnificent across five albums. They covered a lot of ground. They did a lot of interesting things. They split amicably in 2019. And this is the second of Thorpe's uh, solo albums. The first one was very, very simple. It was him and a piano and some very minimalist electronics. This is a bit more ornate. It does some extra things, Um, but it has fundamentally, it's the same very positive thing. Thorpe has an extraordinary voice. Uh, He has an ear for arranging a very limited number of instruments to get a lot of things done. And 
I, it's one of those ones. The first time you listen to it, you think, "Yeah, that's not bad," and then you'll listen to it again, and you think, "Yeah, actually, this is this is quite quite something." Um, and I, yeah, as Phil says, the more the more time you experience with it, the more details sort of come out of the of, uh, of of what you listen to. I think, and it has tunes that start sitting in the back of your head. You're humming them a bit later on, and so on and so forth. Um, do I, in some regard, it's not as starkly beautiful as his first album, Diviner, but it's a more imaginative, more creative, more ambitious piece of work. Um, if you are a CoBuzz or an Amazon subscriber, I believe you can enjoy that in uh, 2496 um, as full fat high res. It's in other versions of high res on Tidal and Apple Music. It is on all the major streaming services. And of course, uh, it is available on physical media as well. Um, and if you wish to support artists, your friendly reminder that I know that there's a global mega site that delivers it for 14 hours after you've ordered it and so on and so forth. But if you do go to the artist website, often as is the case here, you can get things like signed versions, versions of, of, of both the records and CDs that aren't available through more mainstream retailers. Um, and you do know that they're at least receiving something for uh, for their money so um for the money that you're spending with them so that's the album of the week uh i think it's extremely good um if you find this a bit high concept and arty the french artist vitalik uh he looked, put an album out not this week but the week before um he hasn't changed the sound that he's done in nearly 20 years but if you want music to drive incredibly recklessly to it's un <laughs> untouchable i mean obviously no one's driving incredibly recklessly at the moment we can't afford to but imagine that you were or you're playing a computer game with the driving thing in it um fabulous so yeah things picking up there's still still some things to come in 2021 but that is the music release for this week okay thanks very much ed like to say crack an album go listen to it right steve uh, let's move on let's do some 4k discs um and we're gonna have a bit of a halloween twist as well because it's Halloween over the weekend, and uh, people might want to sit in their cinema rooms now they've built them uh, and watch some uh, horror. So, uh, first of all, your 4K discs of the week, Steve. Well, m most of the 4K discs I'm about to mention do qualify as horror films, and that's Good. probably why they've been released in the last week, I guess. Uh, one isn't. One is Colito's Way, um, which is uh, a Brian De Palma Al Pacino film from 1993. Uh, it's kind of like Scarface, but a lot less excessive. Um, would be prepared to say it's De Palma's last great film and also one of Pacino's last great performances, but it's a brilliant film. I hadn't seen it in a long time, maybe not since 93. Um, although in the meantime, I had owned it on Laserdisc DVD and Blu-ray, but I finally got around to watching it again on 4K disc. Uh, it looks superb. It's a beautifully shot film. De Palma is at the top of his game in terms of his camera work. Um, and, and as I say, it's got a great performance from uh, Pacino. It's got a new DTSX soundtrack. Although it's not the most immersive track, but it's a lot of di disco bangers in the soundtrack because <laughs> there's a lot of club scenes that's set in the 70s. Um, it's got a, uh, it's got some great performances, uh, a barely recognisable Sean Penn uh, in support as his uh, coked up lawyer. Uh, it's a great film. I, I recommend it highly. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And, and what's the good it is. what's the disc release like? Any new extras on there? Anything? No, the extras on? are all um, uh, ported over from the previous. Most of the extras were created originally for the DVD release. So they're in standard depth. They're interesting, you know, they cover the making of the film, but so it's nothing new. Right, okay. Uh, Misery um, has just come out on 4K disc. So uh, obviously a Stephen King adaptation by Rob Reiner. Um, you know, the basic premise, which is that a writer gets uh, injured in a car crash, stuck in the, the home of his number one fan uh, during a snowstorm, <laughs> who's not too happy with his new book. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's a great film. It's a really great, fantastic performances from James Kahn as the writer, and obviously an Oscar-winning performance from Kathy Bates as um, I forget, do I remember the name of the character in the moment? No, uh, but what's it? What's it? Name. Anyway, what's it like? Um, a beautiful picture. Uh, I mean, compared to the DVD, Blu-ray, sorry, it's uh, it's in a whole other level in terms of the picture quality. It's a really, really nice new 4K transfer. They've done a cracking job on this one. I think it's Kino Lorber. Um, the extras are largely the same, uh, I believe, from previous Blu-ray releases. Uh, as far as I can tell, they're the same ones on my earlier Shout disc, although there were two extras on the Fat Track that aren't on this. But it's got a whole lot of stuff about stalkers on it, <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, it looks and it sounds fun. I mean, the, the soundtrack uh, is the same as before, but the pitch quality is fantastic. It's absolutely gorgeous. Really nice transfer. They've done a good job there with this 4K restoration. Silence of the Lambs. 
um, which I would class as a horror film, frankly. Um, I know it's essentially a police procedural, but it borders on hammer horror quite a lot of the time, particularly the stuff with Hannibal Lecter where he's down in some dingy cell, which doesn't look anything like a hospital to me. Um, this has got a new four. This has got the same 4K restoration that was done for the Criterion release, but the Criterion release is obviously a Blu-ray. Directly comparing the two, the uh, there is more detail in the 4K disc, and obviously it's got HDR and a, and a, and a better color grade, the wider color gamut, shall I say? Uh, so I would say that the the 4K disc is the preferred viewing experience. Um, both are good though, and obviously there's different extras depending on which one you get, because uh, Criterion don't license their extras out to other other distributors um but yeah I, I, it looks fantastic on 4k it is a brilliant film it, it remains a fantastic movie uh, with brilliant performances from the two leads uh and uh, was the last film and only one of three to win all five of the big oscars best film best director best screenplay best actor and best actress can you name the other two no <laughs> uh, one clever could just nest and it happened one night uh right and then we've got screen 1997, um, Wes Craven, you know, the film that basically, you know, you knew horror was obviously struggling when they start taking the mickey out of horror films. <laughs> uh, but it's still a it, fun movie, it, aren't it? it? It's great how meta it is, though. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Very meta, yeah. Yeah, it's very meta. Really, it's a fun got tired. Yeah. And quite scary at times. Uh, and it uh, looks nice. It's a nice new um, 4K um, transfer. Um, and I, I, luckily, we're, we're lucky in this country because apparently it's bloody hard to get hold of in the States. There seems to be no, there's no supply in the States because there's one factory in America producing discs and everything else is manufactured in Mexico. Um, and so supplies in the States have really fallen off a cliff in terms of uh, new releases or any, any disc release. So, uh, but over here, we obviously have no less issues, I guess, with manufacturing. But, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, there's some, I think I haven't actually gone through all the extras yet. So I, there is a review of this on the site from, um, from Simon believe so um but looks great sounds great definitely worth getting i think and it was then, mark actually that was it mark yeah okay well mark yeah. uh but definitely i knew someone had reviewed it on the site so and then they said it was great oh yeah i can see that stuart's pulled it up so um it was mark yeah um and then finally and this arrived on monday so i literally watched this last night uh, is the howling so dante's 1981 it was like like buses you get no werewolf films for ages and along come two in the same year <laughs> both of which have groundbreaking effects in them. Yeah. Um, one by Rob Boutine and The Howling and obviously Rip Baker on the American World of London. So um, this is uh, from Studio Canal, a uh, new 4K restoration for the 40th anniversary of the film. Uh, I thought it looked awesome. They've done a great job. Again, you know, obviously, you know, there's a degree of film grain, any optical effects, any any optical you know, titles or say it dissolves, that sort of thing, you're going to get um, an increase in grain because there's a second generation there. Um, and using film at night, you tend to get, it gets a bit grainy, but any, any of the sort of interiors, well-lit well, well -lit stuff looks really good. You know, the detail and clothing, that kind of stuff is fantastic. Um, the effects work stands up. Obviously you are seeing it in a lot more detail than ever before, but most of it does still stand up that, uh, you know, Rob Boutin did, there's, there's one terrible shot. I don't even remember the film, but it's when the, the woman's husband is having, you know, is, is shaking this female werewolf and they're in front of a fire and they're sort of transforming. And it's a really badly animated scene that then pans up to the moon. Shockingly bad. Looked bad in 81. It has not aged well and it looks even worse in 4K. Otherwise, though, uh, the practical effects for Robo Teen still look fantastic. Uh, it's a good movie. It's, it's, it's scary. It's fun. It's got loads of loads of references to other hot werewolf movies in it. Um, good cast. Uh, D, D. Wallace um, leads. And... Um, yeah, uh, I was really pleased with that. And it's got some nice extras too. It's got uh, some stuff about Joe Dante on it, which I hadn't seen before. And it's also got, a, it's on DVD, but it's a documentary about monsters and, and makeup effects and that kind of stuff, which I haven't watched yet, but that looks like it would be interesting. Though I'm surprised. I think it's the, it'll be the first DVD I've watched in about 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So um, that's your recommendations for this week, but just obviously on the topic of Halloween. And if you're into your Blu-rays and a little bit niche horror, uh, then of course Mark's article is up uh, on the site at the moment. It's been up for uh, a week or so now. Um, so go and check that out if you like something a little bit quirky, a little bit uh, not uh, mainstream. Uh, Mark is the expert when it comes to those kind of releases, certainly on Blu-ray. And there's lots of uh, studio releases coming through, um, nice little boutique labels, 
uh, always have stuff on the go there. So if you're interested in that, check out Mark's article, which is on uh, the homepage, like I say. But Steve, um, just off the top of your head, you've been looking at a lot of 4K discs uh, over the last few years. Um, which ones stand out for you if people want to scare themselves silly this Halloween? Well, I, I would say... You know, obviously, what people consider to be frightening obviously varies, varies with mileage. But uh, if you're talking about something you're going to watch at home with a good sound system, then you want something that's going to have a, re a really... A lot of the modern horror films do amp up the sound design. They do go for uh, shock scares, um, you know, where it's very, very quiet and bang, really loud. Um, so anything by James Wan would fall into that category, like the, the first two Conjuring movies and the two Insidious films that he directed uh, all, all have some really nice jump scares. Uh, where the sound system, you know, is used to really immerse you and then scare the living daylights out of you. That would be my 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 reference would be go for one of those if you want uh, to give your sound system a good workout um, whilst also scaring the family or yourself. Okay, good stuff. Uh, right, so let's move it on and uh, let's cover what we've been watching this week. And I noticed you put the outlaws in here, Steve. I yeah. I try I tried to watch this. And uh, I just got distracted. I'm going to have to go back and try again. because uh, There's two was... episodes available at the moment uh, on iPlayer. And I will say that the first episode is okay. Takes a while to get going. The second episode is absolutely hysterical. <laughs> uh, it, 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 the opening scene, you're straight off. You're like, yeah, this is a lot, suddenly got a lot funnier. And you really start to like the characters by the end of the second episode as well. You really get involved with their, their backstories and why they're doing community service. Um, so it's sl it's a slow start. If you, I, I just first episode, I was like, mm, it's fifty minutes long. It's you know, it's not mm. half an hour comedy series. It's going on a bit. Do I am I enjoying this? And, and I thought, well, I'll give the second one a go. Second one, I was laughing out loud, really enjoying it. Um, it yes, yeah, and you know, it, it's obviously you know being from the West Country, the Bristol stuff's very funny, and the fact that you got Christopher Walken in it is amazing. <laughs> yeah, um, it is cheers to surreal. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got to say, I. I I tried to give it a go. Like you say, it's a bit of a slow burner and um, there was other things, other things distracting me at the time and I, I just couldn't get into it. But I'm going to go back and give it a try. No, what, yeah, I did see, what I did see, I found quite amusing. So I think, uh, like you say, the second uh, episodes, if that if if it kicks off there, then I'll, I'll stick with it. Yeah, no, don't worry, don't worry. The first five minutes of the second episode are absolutely laugh out loud funny. And okay. um, and and Stephen Merchant is it, it was his a scene with his character, and, and it, he is very funny. And uh, yeah, no, and and then he, and like I say, by the end of the second episode, you're really engaged in the characters themselves and just enjoying spending time with them. So um, yeah, that might be why they dropped the first two episodes at the same time, possibly. Um, was because they they felt they needed that extra push in the second episode to get the, mm. get a a viewership going yeah um but uh yeah yeah the other thing i can mention which is obviously again halloween related is that horror, american horror story season 10 has now started on uh disney plus or star um and uh so far <laughs> so far so much the same as usual but yeah i, I quite enjoyed the series uh okay. and there's also american horror stories which is still running um which is an anthology series that they've done um that's also on, on star so um yeah, worth checking out if you're into that kind of thing. Okay, Ed? Uh, I haven't been watching any horror. It's not what I do. Um, but I have been progressing through the things that I've been talking about over the course of the few last few weeks. So I'm not going to go on about them at length. Still doing Foundation. I am at peace with what they're trying to do, and I'm enjoying it more because I am at peace with what they're trying to do. Um, Are you not adapt the book? <laughs> no, no, no. I think that's an oversimplification. They, The two things... That they're doing differently is they're trying to bend multiple because let's face it foundation the book is is a collection of short stories and they're essentially trying to bend that into a single arc uh they're also doing far more of keeping a, 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 an oversight on what the empire is up to at the same time than asimov ever bothered to do in the book which i guess simply for the logic of narrative they probably have to do so I don't think any of that constitutes a spoiler. I'm I'm still enjoying it. I still look forward to the episode. So that's as much as you know, as much as you can ask for. Uh, and then obviously Taskmaster Bake Off, all the rest of it. I would say on Saturday night, 
um, just gone, uh, the first of four BBC documentaries about 80s music. Yeah, so watch that. Appeared on BBC Two. That was brilliant. And yep. I am looking forward to the next three of those. That mm. was, I, I was a, a thoroughly diverting I hour. forgot about that, but thanks for reminding me. Yeah. I, um, so every Saturday, is it, Ed? Yes. Okay. So I thought that was really, really good. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that it was I can... after. It was after Strictly, so there's no cra- clash there. At all. No, absolutely not. I mean, you know, you, in got... 16 minutes, there's the new Brian Cox series, Universe, that starts on, uh, on hundreds of billions and, and millions and trillions and billions. Yeah, of... yeah. yeah. it'll be him standing somewhere cool. Um, well, the, he'll, he'll have got a nice a... holiday. Yeah, you know, got a nice holiday out of the BBC license bill for that. So, I mean, there's some good, there's some good stuff on. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I've. Uh, given any attention to no I, I would say in terms of things i've added to it was that bbc doc on the 80s um otherwise i'm still loving taskmaster i still think it's a wonderful program it still cheers me up every time i watch it and the bake-off is just the equivalent of steve's duvet in television yeah. form steve did you get through the whole of the squid game yes right because yes, uh, oh, I, I i'm up to three and I, I i've kind of stalled a little bit is it worth sticking with i think so um there's some very tense games coming up um yeah, I mean, I've got a friend who just stopped at three as well, like you. He said he wasn't really engaged, but I don't know. I guess each to their own. But I, I thought it was, uh, um, I thought it was entertaining and and uh, and very tense, and okay. um, and it does raise some interesting questions about the nature of humanity, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, I would say I would, you know, if you want my option, do Outlaws first. That's probably going to be more rewarding in the long run, I suspect. Okay. Um, and if you have any, please watch Only Murders in the Building on, on Disney Plus. It is <laughs> Steve, it fin- Steve finished Brooks last week episodes. and it's fan- yeah. Well, hopefully there's gonna be a second season, I'm glad to say. But um uh it's 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 fantastic. I really, really enjoyed that. And the same goes to Ted Lasso if you haven't watched that and you've got Apple TV Plus. Um it, that's finished now, but uh, that second season was good and it ended really well. You'll forgive the indulgence at this point. It did occur to me that it's the end of the month. And by the time we next do a podcast, it won't be the end of the month. Normally I do other things. Just as an aside, um, I'm not going to talk about vinyl, but very quickly, there is a playlist that dropped on Cobas earlier this month, uh, which is just a uh, an anthology of Daptone records. And it's absolutely sensational. Um, I've already dropped it into Tidal. And if needs be, I can put it into a couple of other streaming services as well. Uh, I complained week in or month in, month out that there have been no good playlists. That was absolutely brilliant. And it's going to cost me a fortune. <laughs> So um, uh, yep, I just did. felt it was worth mentioning. So uh, yeah, I'll dro- stick it into me, the comments. And, yeah, dro- uh, drop me a, t- a, a Tidal or a, a Spotify link, please. Hold on. Okay, I can do that right now. Excellent. Um, well, while you do that, Steve's going to tell us about the podcast competition where you can win the Descent and the Descent Part 2 and Blu-ray. Okay, uh, I will. To win a copy of the Descent and the Descent Part 2, which I believe is not that good, but the Descent is excellent, <laughs> on Blu-ray, just use the following question to select the correct answer from the competitions, competitions page. Who stars in both films? Okay. You need the question because the answers are already up there. So you need that question. Uh, now you can go to the page, uh, avforums.com forward slash competitions. Enter that and yeah, you could win those on Blu-ray. Right. So that's it for this week. My thanks to Ed Selly. The last thing she's going to want is a hairy chest. And Steve Withers. I'm going to split you in half. <laughs> if you... <laughs> I just realised that if you put that with a quote at the beginning of this podcast, that sounds really bad. Okay. Uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, then of course, leave us a like and uh, subscribe to the channel. Of course, hit the notification bell. It'll inform you every time we upload new uh, uh, videos and product reviews and so on and settings and that kind of thing. Uh, also, Twitter, Facebook, go bookmark AV forums. Uh, we're on all the socials, so go find us. And of course, if you are listening on a, uh, a streaming service and they allow you to leave a rating of some description, then please leave us 5, 10, 15, 20 stars, whatever it is. Uh, please remember to leave them for us. Uh, I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And remember to tune in next week for the Movies Podcast. <laughs>